Hi, JC. Hello. So today's serial killer is rust. Rust affects a lot of different cereal crops and there are a number of different species that we need to look at. So what do we know about rust, Josie? Right, okay. Really interesting um, pathogen here. Um, it's an obligate fungal parasite. Mm, so that means it can't live outside of the plant. It can't. Um, there's approximately 8,000 named species. Many of them are host-specific. So... Um, a plant will have its own rust mm. pathogen. There's virtually one for every plant that you could actually make money That's from. That's right. The, of these 8,000 named species, apparently there's many more types not yet discovered in tropical, subtropical regions. So mm. that number could be far higher. Yeah, there could be one growing on an obscure weed in your in your hedgerow that has never been actually discovered because it doesn't infect an economically important crop mm -hmm. and it just goes by the wayside they think uh, biologists think that um, rust fungi are very ancient fungi and they've had the opportunity to co-evolve with so many plants mm. so they, the interest in rust spiked in the or started in the 18th century in italy and in fact, it, their, their scientific name is named after an Italian scientist, Tommaso Puccini. Am I saying that correctly, Josie? <laughs> if you're an Italian heritage, aren't you? I am. Yeah, you I say am. it, go on. Tommaso Puccini. <laughs> <laughs> so there are all, the wheat, the, wheat the, the, effect, the ones that affect cereal crops are all in the Puccinia genus, but there is a much wider family. And that's where the 2,000... Was it 2,000 species? 8,000. 8,000 species. Named from. species. Wow. 8,000 named species. So we've got... It's, rusts can get very complicated very quickly. Um, I guess when you were doing your research, you didn't get confused, but I did get confused. And I've broken it down. It comes in lots of different colours, yeah. shapes, sizes, and it affects all different parts of the plants depending on the actual type of rust. Yeah. So for arable crops, I've broken it down to these seven rusts that should be of interest. We've got brown rust, also known as leaf rust, and that's Puccinia triticini, and that affects wheat, but there's also different variants of that that affect barley, rye, uh, but not oats. So of brown rust, the brown rust that affects wheat won't affect rye, and again, that the one that affects rye won't affect barley. Brown rust... Um, despite its name, is more orange, and it's a late summer disease. Um, so that because it's a late summer disease, it's of low to medium risk for arable farmers in the UK because you're close to harvest by the time it starts to really become a problem. We've got black rust, uh, also known as Puccinia graminis, or stem rust, and that's widespread throughout the globe. That's um, the rust that affects wheat, isn't it? Puccinia it affects wheat, graminis, yep. yeah. Um, but... It's not as much of a problem in the UK and I think that's because it's cold in the winter mm -hmm. um, and so although geographically important for the UK um, that's not so much a problem and yellow rust that's the main one that we're interested in that's Puccinia striformis and that's important because it, it's seriously a problem in the UK especially in the east and it strikes early and if it strikes early that means it can develop throughout the crop and become an issue okay and then there are, I've got four other types of rusts, which I'll quickly go through and then won't mention again. Crown rust, which affects oats only, and hence its scientific name, Coronata crown. And that's, again, it's a late season rust in oats, so it's, it's not as, as devastating as yellow rust. In oilseed rape, we've got white rust, which is not a rust at all. It's more, it's more like a, a mould. It's not even a, fung a true fungus. Um, so we can ignore oilseed uh, white rust for another time. And then in maize, this is where it gets stupid. You get Puccinia sorghi, right? Which you think, oh, sorghum, it must affect maize and sorghum. Mm -hmm. No, Puccinia sorghi only affects maize. maize. And Puccinia purpurea, that's the one that affects sorghum. And it, or usually scientific names change when they're incorrect. But that one, that sorghi, the fact that it doesn't affect sorghum, for some reason, no one's bothered to change the name. So Okay, watch this space. Now that we've highlighted it, it might come up with a yeah. change. Interestingly, though, scientific names only change when there's a confusion. And so there's a beetle in that grows in, that lives in the Balkans. 
and it's named after Hitler. <laughs> and it's, That's a bit unfortunate. Scientists won't change its refuse to change its name because there's no scientific reason to change its name, only a political reason. Um, well, that's, um, yeah, we, you could debate that. Yeah, you think, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not very woke, is it? No. No. So, rust uh, fungus, as you said, really interesting as um, you can't replicate it in a Petri dish. No. Sometimes like mildew you can. Mildew you can grow very easily, um, but rust you can't. You can't. So finding a cure for that is very difficult because mm. um, you can't grow it in a lab. Yeah. Like mildew, though, it's something called a biotrophic fungus. And that means that it is basically tricking the plants into thinking it's not there. It goes into stealth mode. It, it gets the plant to feed itself, as opposed to something like, um, uh, uh, what was think, like Phytophthora or Fusarium, which just goes in there, kills the plant, and mm -hmm. eats, the, eats its innards out of it. Rust doesn't actually kill plants. It just... Mm. limits the growth and production of food so obviously it will affect photosynthesis because obviously the plants won't, the leaves won't be green so plants will become very sickly but they don't actually die as such no the rust the rust wants to keep it alive you know just like a slave really to it so um that's an issue and then it's got a very unusual life cycle rust unlike any other pathogen that will affect an arable crop and that's because it's heterocious. And Josie, you've done a lot of research on this. So yeah, it's leave. um, it it starts off on a different host. Yeah. And then it is um, insects will mediate that. Right. So they transfer the spores. Uh huh. And um, then it will turn into acium, yep. uh, which produce ACO spores. Right. Um. And then these are spread long distance by um, erod erodospores from continental Europe, even. Oh wow! So mm -hmm. it comes all the way from can come all the way from continental mm -hmm. Europe. Yeah, they so these iridospores. They are what grow on the on the on the wheat, and they. It's a bit like if you've seen the film Alien, where they uh, the, the the alien escapes from Sigourney. Is it Sigourney Weaver? No, it's uh, the one of the. Um, she Space hatches mesh. it, doesn't she? Yeah, it's out of his stomach and bursts out. <laughs> if you look at rust under a microscope, it like bursts out of the leaf surface and these spores are released. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty gruesome under a microscope. Yeah. And those spores. And that will then um, go into wheat. Then um, it will overwinter as teleospores on the stubble. And these are the black spores. So you'll notice this rust gets darker as it mm -hmm. goes along and these, these, these dark spores sit on the, in the leaf surface in the leaf litter and then they germinate and hatch and are released in, mm -hmm. the, in the spring. And these basidiospores will then infect the barberry again, mm. um, the stems and leaves, and then the barberry again will reinfect the wheat. Have we mentioned barberry yet? Yeah. So barberry is the alternate host for rust. Yep, yeah. um, and barberry is a plant, it's, it's a shrub, isn't it, in the mm -hmm. buttercup family. And I think that is somewhere where the U.S., they the have American, huge issues with yeah, that. Yeah, in America they they imported both wheat and barberry at the same time, and didn't realise that they were alternate hosts for the same pathogen. That's right. But I don't think barberry's grown widely in the UK, so I think the alternate host is probably something else in the buttercup family, another mm -hmm. weed. Um, I don't come across barberry on my walks no. around the countryside, so no. um, <laughs> I think that's um, it. Rust infects the wheat plant through the stomata, so it actually goes through the. The, the pores, the guard cells, and forms what we call a house storia, like a clamp That's on the right. cells that That's feeds right. off it. The hyphae from the fungus, um, the little hyphae uh, will actually break through the plant cell wall mm. and then they create the historium. So it's attaching itself to those cells. And it's pretty amazing that the plant doesn't detect that and fight against it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a biochemical trickery. Um, on the on the fungus's parts so yield losses do you have any figures for yield losses i haven't got yield losses as yeah. such not with um um in the agriculture industry but in the hortic industry it really does affect um a lot of flowers and flowering plants mm. and a lot of fruit plants plums um, blueberries. Blueberries are worth thirty-two million pounds in the UK as an industry, um, but 
they do suffer from rust, as and the plum industry is worth eight point six million. Ukraine, so, Ukraine is massive for blueberries. I once went to a show called Fruit Logistica in Germany, and all day it was just blueberry farmers from the Ukraine asking oh, really? me questions. Eventually, I just said, "Yeah, it works brilliantly on blueberries in Ukraine," because I knew they were all blueberry farmers. But yeah, um, in yellow rust can take forty percent of the crop um, if you had no control and just let let it go year on year. And then something, a later variety of rust, like the crown rust and oats, that's going to be 20%, so not as bad, but still worth controlling if it's effective. Um, various different rusts have different abilities to overwinter. So some, as we say, can survive in the leaf litter. Mm -hmm. And that de that's de really depends, really governs whether it can take hold in the UK. So, Well, the optimum... Uh, conditions for rust infection are when temperatures are between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, and the foliage is wet. So with um, irrigation, it's best to irrigate in the early morning hours so that the plants can dry up, out mm. over the day, but to definitely avoid overhead sprinklers and to use something like drip irrigation and soaker hoses instead. Yeah, if you're a nursery. Yeah, to keep those um, leaves dry. And soft leafy growth is most susceptible. And I guess that's because the stomata are open and so the spores can, their, their germination tube can get through the stomata. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it was dry, then the stomata are partially closed or fully closed. And so that, that, that spore is never going to get through. That's right. Um, and this, so if we're talking about a cold winter being things like the, the maize rust will never overwinter. And the black rust won't overwinter um, in in the UK. So, but with climate change, that could be a different thing. Yeah. So. Also, a rapid increase in temperature and higher light um, will exacerbate the problem. But the leaf needs to be wet for six to ten hours, and at the moment, with the weather that we're having, that's mm. not difficult. No. So we've had a very wet and hot year haven't we mm -hmm. so it's perfect conditions for rust to take yeah. hold um we've we've seen a lot of interest in in farmers coming to us looking for rust control this year so um that's been something to look at um late sowing um is an issue making sure you get rid of all the volunteers so wheat from previous years you want to get rid of um one of the key issues that a number of farmers have spoken to us about is the removal of an active ingredient. So for some of the fungicides have been removed, uh, one called CTL, chlorothalonil, has been removed and people have come to us looking for alternatives by fungicides. Copper fungicide and sulfur fungicide seem to be something that were used to control it. Yeah, it's a copper. Copper isn't, I don't like copper. Um, I have a big bee in my bonnet about Copper fungicides and copper, mainly copper fertilizers. So people sell copper fertilizers, and no crop in the UK has ever been deficient in copper. It's so a no micronutrient need. of a very small. Yeah, and copper is highly toxic. It's a heavy metal. Mm -hmm. It's toxic to humans um, in very small amounts, and so um, you want really want to be looking for alternatives to copper. What about sulfur fungicide? Sulfur is good, but it's acidic, so mm -hmm. you can strip the plants of calcium. And so you can do more harm than good, especially if you're looking to produce strong cell walls. Taking calcium out of the, the cells is basically acid rain. Um, we produce something called lime sulfur, which is an alkaline form of sulfur. It's very good at killing any fungal pathogen, but it also kills all the beneficials as well. So only use lime sulfur when it's um, a last resort, I would say, when your crop is on its knees. Um, there are triazoles, strobilurins, these are semi-natural, strobilins are um, fungicides, triazoles are fully synthetic, and as I say, Bayer, BSF, Syngenta, they're the guys to speak to when it comes to conventional synthetic fungicides. They're expensive, people are moving away, especially regen farmers, um, and it's something that we've looked at Utrema intensively this year. So we've developed something called the Fungicide Reduction Action Plan, or FRAP, with our farming um, collaborators and we'll be uh, mailing that out to a lot of farms this year and that's just talking about different products that can be used to make the plant healthier more resistant and then using biofungicides to control rust mildew septoria alternaria. so have you heard of 
Bacillus subtilis. Bacillus subtilis. Yeah, it's a then it's a that's a biological control product. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's um, it's registered for a number of products, and it's a, a biofungicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's approved for organic gardening. Yep. So um, that would be something that would outcompete and also kill the the rust, and it's non toxic to humans. You can t- treat and pick crops the same day. Yes. So it's got a no pre harvest interval. No. Um, Rust itself is not poisonous to humans, but if you do eat anything that's got rust on it, the food might taste off. What would it taste like? Rusty. Off. Just off. Off. Yeah. It, it can infect um, the ears of um, cereal crops as well if it gets really bad. Um, one of the other biological control methods I thought about was yellow ladybirds. Have you ever come across yellow ladybirds? No. So in, in Australia, they have these yellow ladybirds that eat spores off oh, right. the surfaces. So for mildew, they actually eat powdery mildew and things like that uh, you can't actually buy them in the uk but you can actually buy them as a biocontrol agent in australia I think because they're native there this year though there has been a distinct lack of buzzy insects and any kind of flying insects i found <laughs> that's your i thought you were going to mention a study then and there's no, no, no I just found, so that josie has found no i have personally found a distinct lack of buzzy insects yeah on your car windscreen yes yeah um uh, how are you going to identify rust? I guess it just it looks rusty. It normally occurs from the ground up. Yeah. And it's usually on the underside of leaves. Yeah. Um, it actually can cause other symptoms like witch's broom. Yes. Uh, cankers. Yeah, I think that's on non-arable crops though. Okay. Oozes. Yeah. Yeah. And on conifers... Um, it's really nasty on conifers. Yeah, the yeah. needles will be affected by it and the bark Yeah. as well. Um, basically, if you've got premature leaf fall, mm. um, stunted growth, off colour, weak plants. I think one of, one of the things you'll see on Twitter when farmers are looking at rust is they push the whole plant down to get right down mm-hmm. because that's where the rust is going to develop from first, the ground right, up. right at the base. Yeah, yeah. Because you need virtually 100% humidity for it to take hold. And mm-hmm. so at the top of the plant, it's not where you're going to see it. Um, as I say, for organic control, um, at Utrema, we make a product called Kytosan, and that's a biofungicide that is, that is authorised for use on cereals um, against rust. And what it does, it attaches to the lesions, dries them out, and seals them so spores can't be released. But one of the key things that Kytosan does is that it contains, because it contains the same chemical that rust is made of, chitin, it, the plant detects that it's under attack by a pathogen. Now, normally rust is able to become this stealth parasite because it's turned off the chitin receptors but when you go in there and spray chitosan it turns all these receptors back on and so we've seen amazing results on rust great um, we've seen farmers say that it's it's unbelievable the effects um, on yellow rust over in the east in yorkshire humberside um, northumberland and so we definitely uh, recommend trialing that we also recommend applying um Sea silica, which is our organic silicon product, alongside to make the cell wall stronger, and then we also have um, salicylic acid, which is a another elicitor of plant defences that acts systemically and can be used as a root drench. So um, there are a number of options when it comes to controlling it. Also, things like mycorrhiza. Um, a lot of farmers wouldn't have necessarily used mycorrhiza, beneficial fungi, in the past, but the move to regenerative farming and no-till makes makes sense makes makes sense because you're not plowing up that mycorrhiza that you've invested in each year so um, mycorrhiza will make plants more resi- resilient maybe not to rust but other uh, but things like take oil and stuff like that mm-hmm. it's definitely a good angle um so it's like kite sounds good you can literally see the plant the lesion dry up after after 12 24 hours oh that's good so that's good um just going back to the Barbary, did you know there was a war against Barbaries in America? Did you no. know about this? So they, in the 19, I think it was the 1920s, they just decided they were going to kill all the Barbary <laughs> in, in the, like the Corn Belt and places like that. And, and they just, just and, and, and everyone got, took part and it was a big, in all the newspapers and everyone, and they wiped it out from massive regions. And I just think to do that now, you just get loads of people going, well, you're not taking my Barbaries out of no, my garden. I know, you'd you know, get Save the Barbary campaign. I know you would, yeah. And so, yeah, there are important... People tying themselves to Barbary plants. You'd have, yeah, maybe the left and the right would, you'd have the hippies and the, the yeah. MAGA people united in saving these plants. But, yeah, at the detriment to the farmers, maybe. 
So he says climate change is going to be an issue, um, especially if, with warmer winters. We're yeah. seeing that um, warmer winters, and it's been very wet as well. But a lot of plants um, are suffering with this climate change. Mm. Uh, roses, particularly, having spoken to a, a lot a big producer of roses um they're not actually sure what, what direction they're going to go in mm. because they've had to withdraw a lot of roses for sale because they cannot survive with the um climatic conditions we've got in this country mm, i guess black spot as well is going to be yeah well, horrendous so. yeah so we when we look at rust in other countries it's a massive issue in south africa um syria um it's thought that the a rust outbreak in Syria were contributed to the civil war and the sharp rise in food prices. Absolutely. So one of many examples of where a plant disease has led to political change. Um, you can link political change in India to the price of onions, the Irish potato famine, um, or the just the famine, um, is linked to potato blight, as is World War, the defeat of the Germans in World War One. Um, so Many l- famines have been caused by fungi. But even, you know, governments change when, when, when crops are destroyed. Mm-hmm. So rust has that ability. It can be that bad. It can so. also affect grasses, literally like your lawn. Mm. When you're walking along it, these, you know, your shoes will get full of this yellow powdery stuff. And I think as well, rust in America on lawns can actually be health problems because mm-hmm. of the amount of spores that are released. Luckily, those won't be affecting wheat or barley, things like that, but... The same climatic conditions will be affecting them. So, as we say, rust is a is an unusual unusual pathogen in that it's heterotious. It affects. It needs an alternate host. It, it can't be grown outside. Um, it can. It yield. The yield losses can be remarkably high. Forty percent for stem rust if you if you get it early on. Luckily, farmers that we've been using with the Kaisersan have, have seen really good results. Um, combine that with silica and. Um, in, in a treatment program and you can remove a lot of the synthetic fungicides so definitely something to look into if you're a farmer who's looking to control rust on your farm yeah it's really big in the horticultural industry with flowers and floriculture yep too brilliant so any final thoughts on rust josie before we leave um interestingly hot water um will can you can use hot water as a um, control because um, rust only exists in a narrow temperature band yeah. so if you use hot water it will kill it That's however i'm not sure it will do your plant many favors but it will kill that pathogen that is someone out there is going to think of a way of utilizing that that hot water yeah hmm. well we, steam is often used as soil sterilant in yeah. um Strawberry crops, so it'd be interesting to know. Well, it will be, it will live on, because you have to check the ground level. Mm. So obviously some sort of hot treatment or something might. Do you know what, Josie, you're going to be responsible for farmers. Just you see these, steam, <laughs> what's, what's that farmer doing? Is he, is he setting fire to his crop? No, no, he's, he's using the Josie <laughs> method of steaming his wheat. Yes, yes. Or her wheat, sorry, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. Hot water. Brilliant. So that was Rust, our serial killer for this week. Uh, next week we'll be covering thrips hopefully thrips so, uh, lovely they are Stop, um, i'm just itching at the thought of that yeah thunder not flies. in a good way yeah <laughs> thunder th- thunder flies not thunder flies <laughs> brilliant all right till next week thank you very okay much. take care